welcome back to Digging Deeper. Did I do that right? Welcome back to Digging Deeper. We came in here today and we were going to talk about phone calls and why it's so deadly to be missing phone calls. But, you know, after talking with a lot of clients, we decided that that wasn't as relevant at the moment, right? Yeah, I mean, it's always going to be relevant. It's something we have to do. Um, but I think there's other topics that are more pressing right now. And so we were just sitting here, just him hauling around. <laughs> and uh, so we decided we were going to kind of riff on some different stuff today. And the first thing that came up when we started talking about what to riff on was, hey, and this conversation has happened with a lot of clients, I imagine, our fleet's full. What should we do? Mm. So when you two experts here, my fleet is full, what's the first thing you think of? I always ask a question, and it's Seth's question. What's the next problem you're trying to solve? Like, what's the next problem? Because, yeah, that's a big problem that your truck's full, but that's not the only one that a recruiting department's going to face. So I, I, wanna, I want them to be thinking, and I want our teams to be thinking, what's the next problem now that we've reached top of a mountain? We're not done yet. Well, yeah. And if you think even bigger picture, is that too much? Bigger picture. Uh, <laughs> if you think even bigger picture, everybody still wants to be as profitable as possible, right? Sure, Every yeah. company needs to be as profitable as possible. Um, how that occurs may change based on the market. So when you, you've worked at a fleet, when you hear we want to be – our my fleet's full, what can I do to become more profitable at that point? So one of the first things I would recommend people look at is are all your drivers equally profitable? Oh, Yeah. Because the answer is going to be no, no, definitely not. Talk right? to ops. Like, like any position anywhere, you're going to have top performers, you're going to have your, you know, the average, and then you're going to have some bottom performers. So if I'm looking to be as profitable as possible, one thing I'm going to look at is, hey, for those bottom performers, if I went ahead and um, looked at getting top performers to potentially replace that group, what would that do to my bottom line? How do you go about doing that? What does that even mean? I'll throw this one to Kyle because I know he's been pretty passionate about it in the last little bit. Um, what would you recommend, Kyle, that somebody takes a look at to try to figure that out? Um, yeah, I think you absolutely need to kind of sort of sort and rank your drivers based off of the violations and the costs that they're kind of bringing in. Yes, there's a, a hard cost with that ticket. So, or, you know, the failed inspection because they didn't do their pre-trip. Some simple things like that. They they have to have glasses with them and they're just not wearing them. So that's a pretty big CSA violation that hurts the entire fleet score. So I, I'm going to look at my heavy hitters for what's causing the violations and cost. And that's a that's a, a pretty easy exercise. Can make, lead to some difficult decisions. But to Seth's point, when I sort of get my scores cleaned up, I get safer, if you will, as a fleet score. I can go back to my insurance company and say, I want to renegotiate or I want to rerun my, my safety scores here, try to get a lower insurance premium. That's a huge problem. That's cash at the bottom line. So that, that's the first place I would go and look to try to find, you know, where can I improve my scores um, to try to save some money on what I'm paying for insurance every year. Okay. okay. Is safety the only avenue there or is it beyond safety? Do top performers okay. produce revenue in other ways? So there's a couple ways. I mean, more than a couple, but Two that come to mind, the biggest ways to improve your bottom line is either to add additional top line revenue yeah. or to cut costs. Yeah, correct. And I think every fleet would love to just add more revenue. But in the market we're in now, it's not, it's different now than it was two years ago. Very different. So one of the best ways then becomes, okay, if I can't add more top line revenue, I need to be more efficient. Yeah. I need to cut costs somewhere. So what Kyle just mentioned is is ways to cut costs. Right. Sure, you know, we would love um, drivers to haul more freight and, and not decline any loads and that type of thing. But we've seen the freight markets um, take a hit. And mm -hmm. we're all kind of trying to figure out where it's headed next. 
So I would say a great place to start wouldn't be necessarily how can we add more revenue, even though we should always be focusing on that. It's how do we become more efficient? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I and to that point, um, I was talking with uh, Scott, Mal- Scott Maldonado this week, and he said that they knew the profitability by contract as well. And within those contracts, who had been hauling that freight? So I could, if the three of us are all in one, working one particular contract, hauling freight every single week for the same shipper, and David is, is more profitable for more loads or more on time or whatever, they were sorting their drivers that way too, which I, th- I never would have thought about on a, to your point of, can I be more efficient even where I'm already efficient? Right. You know what I mean? Where can I squeeze some more profit margin right now when things can be a little uncertain? Now's a great time to do Break that. Break that down for me a little more. I didn't quite. So is by shipper, by dr- driver? Okay, so so suppose we're all on a dedicated run. Yeah. Right, and we're all in kind of this, the same, um, we all probably have the same driver manager even. Yep. Um, they would sort their drivers for the, of that particular dedicated contract to see who's the most profitable. Put, look at your fuel costs. Yeah. You're, you're idling less than I am. My fuel tab is higher than yours. Your risk score and your CSA score is better than mine. And they would go, okay, it's not necessarily the whole contract or the whole dedicated run I need to look at. It's the little bits and pieces within it that I can really hone in to be more efficient. And I, and I honestly had never thought about that. I thought it was a brilliant move um, that some fleets are starting to do too. So can can I jump in here too? Yes, I think, you may. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> he's so polite. He's trying to take over my show just because I know he's got one. <laughs> Kyle and I are just are just chatting. Hey, um, hey. This is digging deeper with Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say a year or two. You know, in the past couple of years, I'll put it that way. We've had a number of fleets. You know, say these words. The only drivers looking right now are the ones that we don't want to hire anyway. Mm. Right? Ooh, yeah. So mm. I think that has shifted as well. Big time. I, I really I really do. Because when you look at the number of drivers looking to the compared to the number of jobs being posted, it's never been higher that ratio. Right. Never. Right. So there's there's eleven drivers to every job driving job being posted. Ooh. You go two years go back two years ago and it was two or three drivers right. per job being posted. Started twenty twenty two, it was four point seven. So that's what? That's nearly a multiple of three. Yeah. So I was like that's almost a three hundred percent change mm-hmm. in either or the number of drivers looking for a job or the amount of competition that's in the market. So you've got a yeah, I think you've had a huge vacuum of leave the market of people posting while you still have drivers need a job. Yeah, still at the same time, right? But, let, but let's get back to your, let's get back to your point. So, mm-hmm. what you're saying is because there's that many drivers per job, yeah. it's essentially Ill- illogical to assume that every one of those drivers is just the bottom of the barrel. That's right. That's right. And and, and why the increase, right? Uh, somebody might say, well, one thing that we've seen over time in this market is that. As drivers' miles begin to drop, turn I, turnover begins to increase. Makes sense, right? Because a lot of drivers are paid on a per mile basis. And so if they were running 2,800 miles consistently, and now they're only running 2,200 miles consistently, that's a significant drop in their income. Hey, what else is out there? Uh, there are, a, uh, I can't say how many fleets that have been experiencing that in the last probably month and six weeks. And it's a drop in total miles. I mean, this is you. So now you're going to have experienced drivers with smaller paychecks. They are not going to sit around. They are going to go find somebody that can help guarantee or, you know, greater assurances on the number of miles they're going to get per week. Cause I mean, that's, that's what's the, the big sticking point for a lot of those drivers right now. Yeah. And, and so part of the shift too that we're seeing in the advertising space is, gosh, go back a year or two ago and everybody was lowering their qualifications, mm-hmm. right? Or adjusting. <laughs> hey, we only need six months of experience. Well, now it's the opposite where they're going, we're only taking somebody with two years of experience. So they've raised the bar when it comes to who they're even taking a look at. Right, right. If we look at pay, we know through 2021 and into 22, it was constant (laughs) increase in pay. It was like the Wild West, like nothing I've ever seen. Now it's how it's flatlined. It seems like it's kind of stopped with 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 the big raises. What does that mean in this market? Does it mean anything? Is there any sort of thing that pe- that fleets can look at to gain an advantage here? Yeah, that's a tough one because 
Nobody wants to advertise that they decreased their pay. Right. Right. <laughs> but we have been in discussions with fleets saying, maybe we're paying too much now. Right. What do we do about that? Because even a one cent difference is huge. Right. Massive. So it's tough to make those calls. So what do you base? What do you look at? Right. It was kind of your question to, to determine that. And one of the best things to look at is, well, look at all the job posts out there. Yeah. Right. Because there's some really good data out there that we can provide. Um, <laughs> right. Maybe a that, that will show you how that has changed where, you know, if I'm just putting numbers out there, um, let's say it was 72 cents per mile was being advertised, you know, last year. Ooh. Now it's maybe 60, 62 cents per say, mile. That's right. Right. So um, it's nice to be able to look at those metrics and see how it's changed. Well, and so what I was thinking of is if pay is flatlined a little bit, then and we just said people are at drivers are at fleets where they're happy with the pay amount as far as like per mile. The problem is the actual how many miles. So I was thinking of if you were looking for a way to attract experienced drivers rather than leading in with the what we pay of like these are the amount of miles that our drivers are averaging right now basically a subtle flex to say hey we're finding enough freight that uh our drivers are still staying plenty busy like as a way to kind of attract that top tier talent yeah absolutely and so a lot of people will or, or should at least refer to their portfolio of business, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like, who are the shippers that we work with? These are still extro extremely strong markets. Yeah. Um, you have nothing to worry about, right? Come here. We've got some great contracts, great, you know, retailers, or whoever it may be that we're running freight for. All right. And that kind of leads me to where I was thinking of heading next here is so we're talking about for those just joining us not that that's how this works but for those <laughs> that are just joining us here's the call in number I'm just kidding uh we're talking about what do you do when your fleet's full what are what are the pivots that you make because you still want to be profitable as a business uh we've talking more at the moment about we said you can add top line revenue you can cut costs right now we're talking about how to be more efficient how to cut costs how to move the same amount of freight for less money uh how do we in this market, what do we do to try to steal market share? I mean, to your point, I think this is a great or another element to that efficiency conversation for a fleet is I need to get more market share with my my shippers that have the best OR and it's driver friendly freight. Like now is the time to try to get as much of that as I can, because if I've got the miles and pay right now, and if I can go from 15 to 20 loads a week or something like that, I mean, if if you can see that there are other fleets hauling some of that freight that you wish you had, that's a way for you to increase that top line that we're talking about while also knowing you've got the efficiencies in place to, to keep that margin for that particular customer. So it's I think it's now's the time to try to be strategic in who you're doing business with, because once upon a time it was. There was heyday for freight from everybody. Well, let's look at who we're actually shipping for as well and say the same way we we're just talking about sort of ranking my drivers or ranking my routes, that type of thing. Let's start ranking our, our customers and say, who can we get more from right now? This is a great opportunity to do it too because there's still freight out there. It's just how can I optimize my, the, the customers that I'm working with? So part of it is just the intelligence. Right. Well, right. I was about yeah. to say, just yeah, knowing... Yeah. Yeah. Do we have, say, Seth, do we have anything that could help <laughs> fleets with that? <laughs> we do. <laughs> oh. And it's under just, development and yeah. it will be coming out very soon. Sweet. All right. Well, let's break that down a little bit more about, I'd like you to add your, your two cents on that idea of uh, stealing market share, finding partners to w work with that could be more profitable for you. Yeah. So- Part of what came to mind, and this may not be what uh, what you were asking for, but is, yes, of course, let's do that, right? That's a big thing to focus on. But where my mind went was, even if we're not focused on stealing market share right now, what are the things that we can do so as the market shifts again, mm -hmm. we've prepared ourselves to really take hold oh, of yeah. that market? Yep. So one of the things that came to mind, just as an example, is... 
when we think about, you know, the COVID pandemic, when things really shut down, mm -hmm. we've gotten a lot of feedback since then from fleets that either stayed steady, held, held the course, who then their profitability shot up once things started to open because they never turned it down mm -hmm. or not as much. And what then we back turned it down. So um, putting the, the, the foot on the gas, right, leaving our message out there, continuing to hire, continuing to develop a pipeline. And then on the opposite end, we hear from people that said, you know what, we actually paused our campaigns and we really didn't do much, if any, advertising during that time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It took us months to catch back up again because our pipeline had dried up. Right. So, yes, of course, grab market share right now if you can, but also be thinking about what can we do right now so that when there's more market share to be had, we're going to be able to take advantage of that. Yeah, if, I mean, if there's one thing we know about the freight market is that it comes back. And when it comes back, it comes back in a big way always. And everyone starts scrambling and going nuts. Right. And so there are a lot of things you could be doing. So that scramble is a lot less uh, chaotic and a lot more of an easy, you know, transition into, all right, now we're ready to start hiring drivers. What about from a... Um, well, let's, I was going to take it somewhere, but let's actually dig into that a little bit more. Of mm -hmm. When we say, because I'm going to kick this one over to you. Uh, <laughs> when we say, keep your foot on the gas, don't don't go dark, you know, keep your message out there. What does that mean to you when I say, keep your message out there? I think you need to keep the impressions high with drivers, period. So just because I I don't have the trucks to put the driver's seats today, I need to be doing the things today so that three months, six months from now, drivers think about me when they're ready to make a move. So that could be, an, that's going to lead to efficiencies in the near and long term. Because if I can get that driver thinking about Randall Riley trucking today, when they're upset, when their paycheck shrinks a little, who are they? I need them thinking about Randall Riley trucking in that moment. So I think just you can shift kind of the strategy or the execution of your, of your marketing budget more into a branding play right and it makes perfect sense to do that now, i'm going to i don't need the leads that i that i had i think efficiency now i'm going to over train my recruiters i'm going to listen to more phone calls i'm going to coach them more so that to your point when the market does shift my recruiters are you know an all-star team i mean nobody's perfect in the heyday of getting as many hires as you can i couldn't slow down to uh to coach my recruiters like i needed to I needed every lead I could get my hands on. Right. It was wild west. So now is the time, okay, to the point of what's the next problem to solve. Let's also prepare ourselves for the problems that could be coming so that when, the, to your point, David, when they, when that, those do come in, um, I can address them, I can hit them head on and mm -hmm. my whole team's going to be more efficient. So you taught, you kind of segued nicely and this is supposed to be my job, but so, whatever you said quite nicely. <laughs> You've taught so me we well. talked about branding, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. as a way to, is we're going to, and we say get our messages, basically we're going to advertise our culture. Yes. We're going to yes, advertise right. our culture so that people under make ourselves attractive that's for right. when the market comes and, back. And not nearly enough fleets do that. Not nearly enough fleets do that. But then you segue to just internal processes. So okay. let's talk about that. What are some things as far as internal processes that we could be working on right now so that when the market does come back, we are ready to go and we're a finely tuned hiring machine? So I'll give you one example. It's our people, right? That That's ultimately what our culture is. And what can we do for our people right now? What kind of training can we provide, right? Because, gosh, in the past couple of years, we've go, 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 go. Okay, maybe things have slowed down a little bit. What a great time to provide training yeah. for recruiters or, or anybody. Processors, anybody. Yeah, like absolutely. Just find efficiencies right now. Yeah, and, and cross-train too. Yeah, so if um, recruiters aren't staying busy right now, can we plug them into other areas to begin to cross-train? Um, maybe it's, you know, driver manager or sales or something in operations, right? So let's begin to cross-train um, because that's going to make us a stronger organization so that once again, when the tide turns, we're coming out stronger than we were before. So we, we one thing that we talked about even beforehand was kind of people have even shifted to uh, we don't have the trucks necessarily. So to increase our capacity, 
we're looking to hire on owner operators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. But that's not where I'm headed. I'm headed since this is more of a hiring show to, uh, one reason you may not have trucks available is you got trucks that are sitting because they need work. Ooh. And so I don't know if, I don't know if you guys know this, but we also help hire technicians and we're talking about what could recruiters be doing, you know, that if they're not as busy trying to hire drivers is one thing is shifting to hiring more technicians so that you have more trucks available, also building it up and getting it ready for when you need additional capacity, having trucks available. What do you think about that? I think it's a great idea. I mean, <laughs> we, we've seen the average age of a fleet the last couple of years increase, mm -hmm. right? Because there's been... Uh, a shortage, right, of, of chips, which has then led to manufacturing slowdowns. Um, so absolutely, I think that's a great idea, right? Let's get let's get the shop in order, mm -hmm. right? Let's make sure we've got the labor there um, because there's been part shortages as well. So we've had trucks sitting against the fence just because we've waiting for we've been waiting for for parts to come in, but also people to be able to work on it. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So we're hearing a lot of that right now, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more expensive than a wasted asset. Mm -hmm. So that truck is so expensive just sitting there. Right. Um, and there's nothing more profitable than an asset that I can bring back to the fleet. So can I get that truck back up and running? And mentioning scores a minute ago, bumper to bumper, can I get, can I get that VIN back into my fleet operating, making me money again? Um, and to the point of driver recruiters, recruiting technicians, you've already got people that are great at talking to people with your recruiters. Train them now on how to talk to a technician. Go grab somebody out of you know your maintenance department and blitz them and buy them lunch and just say, what's really important to you? And let your recruiters learn how to recruit that person so they can have those conversations. And, and some fleets have been doing that where people that were, they were charged with hiring you know five drivers a week and they're right now they're only getting two and to Seth's point, their paycheck's a lot smaller. We got to find something else for that talented people person to do. Let's get let's get them trained on how to do it. Some technician hiring too, and they may end up specializing in it. Right. You know, and so now they're able to to use their talents in other areas for the for the organization. Add more value. Trucks are back on the road for low cost because it's you know it's the parts and the labor, and it's win 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 for everybody. And, and just to circle back to a little bit to where we started, right, when, when talking about efficiencies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes we refer to the, the inspection selection score, right, where if somebody goes through an inspection lane, there's red, yellow, green, depending on the score of that fleet that dun, dun, dun. can impact, well, does impact <laughs> uh, how often they get stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So by working on your fleet... Uh, and and your shop and making sure maintenance and everything's in order when you go through those inspection lanes it's going to improve your score because everything's in order yep fewer right? delays yeah exactly exactly fewer delays and as a result of having better scores it means down the road you'll get the green light more often that's right um, so that that just helps your efficiency even more I think we'll end it there. I think that was an excellent episode. Probably peaked the mic right there. <laughs> excellent episode <laughs> of Digging Deeper. Uh, we hope you f all join us for this episode. Ask all the questions you want. And that was what to do when your fleet is full. Thank you. Bye.